According to a recent survey, the number of Americans who say they're eating pretty much whatever they want is at an all-time high, which unfortunately includes too few fruits and vegetables as well as too little variety. Half of all fruit surveys are taken up by just six foods— OJ, bananas, apple juice, apples, grapes, and watermelons. And half of vegetables are made up of iceberg lettuce, frozen potatoes, fresh potatoes, potato chips, and canned tomatoes. Not only are we not eating enough period and missing out on the healthiest fruits, berries, and the healthiest vegetables, dark green leafies, the fruit and vegetable palate for our palate is sadly lacking. Why does dietary diversity matter? Because different foods may affect different problems. Uh, cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, and Brussels sprouts are associated with lower risk of colon cancer in the middle and right side of our body, whereas risk of colon cancer further down on the left side of our body appears to be better lowered by carrots, pumpkins, and apples. So different fruits and vegetables may confer different risks for cancer of different parts of even the same organ. Variety is the spice of life and may prolong it. Independent of quantity, variety in fruit and vegetable consumption may decrease lung cancer risk, meaning if two people are eating the same number of fruits and vegetables, the one eating a greater variety may be at lower risk. And it's not just cancer. In a study of thousands of men and women, a greater quantity of vegetables and a greater variety may independently be beneficial for reducing the risk of type 2 diabetes. Even after removing the effects of quantity, each different additional two items per week increase in variety of fruit and vegetable intake was associated with an 8% reduction in incidence of diabetes. Why? Well, it may be attributable to individual or combined effects of the many different bioactive compounds contained in fruits and vegetables. Thus, consuming a wide variety will increase the likelihood of consuming more of them. All the vegetables may offer protection against chronic diseases, but you know, each vegetable group contains a unique combination of these phytonutrients, distinguishing them from other groups, because each vegetable contains a unique combination. A greater diversity of vegetables should be eaten to get all the health benefits. Does it matter, though, if we get alpha-carotene or beta-carotene? Isn't an antioxidant an antioxidant? No, it's been shown that phytochemicals bind to specific receptors and proteins in our bodies. For example, there appears to be a green tea receptor in our body, a receptor for EGCG, a key component of green tea. There are binding proteins for the phytonutrients in grapes, onions, and capers. I've talked about the broccoli receptor already. Uh, recently, a cell surface receptor was identified for a nutrient concentrated in apple peels. And importantly, these target proteins are considered indispensable for these plant foods to do what they do, but they can only do it if we actually eat them. Uh, just like it's better to eat a whole orange than just to take a vitamin C pill, because otherwise you'd miss out on all the other wonderful things in oranges that aren't in the pill, by also eating a different fruit like an apple, we won't miss out on all the wonderful things in apples that aren't in the orange. When it comes to the unique phytonutrient profile of each fruit and vegetable, it's like comparing apples to oranges. One of the reasons breastfed infants may have better cognitive and visual development is because human milk contains long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids like the omega-3 DHA, while most available infant formulas did not, based on data like this where infants given control formula without DHA didn't do as well as those given DHA-fortified formula. Neither did as well as the breastfed infants, who serve as the gold standard. But this was enough to convince formula manufacturers to start adding DHA to their infant formula starting back in 2002. The question then became how much to add. Easy, right? Just add however much is naturally found in breast milk. However, the DHA level in breast milk is extremely variable, depending on what the mom is eating. For example, there's all these healthy populations that don't eat any seafood and have much lower levels in their milk, and they seem fine, so that makes it difficult to determine the optimal amount to add to formula, or for that matter, what to recommend for pregnant and breastfeeding women. Consensus guidelines recommend that women should aim to consume an average of 200 mg a day of DHA during pregnancy. 
Of course, this isn't as simple as encouraging women to eat more fish because of the toxic pollutants, such as mercury, such that for most fish, such as tuna, the brain damage caused by the mercury would exceed the benefit from the DHA. And some pollutants, like PCBs, can get stuck in our bodies for decades, and so it's not enough to just eat clean during pregnancy. What about purified fish oil? The methods supplement manufacturers use, like distillation, leave considerable amounts of PCBs and other pollutants in the product, so, so much so that, taken as directed, salmon, herring, and tuna oils would exceed the tolerable daily intake of toxicity. Thankfully, one can get the benefits without the risks by getting DHA from algae instead, which is where the fish get it from, and so pregnant and breastfeeding moms can cut out the middle fish and get DHA directly from the source at the bottom of the food chain where we don't have to worry about toxic pollutants. But until recently, we thought everyone should take these long-chain omega-3s for their heart, uh, but the balance of evidence is now such that doctors should no longer be recommending fish oil intake or fish consumption solely for prevention of coronary heart disease. But what about for expectant and breastfeeding mothers? What's the latest signs show? Put all the studies together, and turns out adding DHA to formula does not appear to help infant cognition after all, similar to other recent compilations of evidence that showed no significant benefit. In fact, at least four meta-analyses, or systematic reviews, have reached a similar conclusion. Now, these were mostly based on a standard series of measurements known as the uh, Bailey Scales for Infant Development. Maybe if other tests were used, there'd be different results. But so far, uh, no luck. Given, giving uh, women DHA supplements during pregnancy did not appear to help with other outcomes like attention span or working memory either. Although there may be no significant benefits for infant cognition, what about other things like vision? Six trials have been done to date supplementing pregnant women. Four showed no effect, and the two that showed benefit had some problems. And so we really don't know at this point. But hey, if all the studies so far show either nothing or benefit, why not just take them to err on the side of caution? Yeah, no demonstrable clear and consistent benefits, but there's new studies on this coming out all the time. If it's harmless, maybe women should just take it to be on the safe side. The problem is that it may not be harmless in large doses. In a study in which women were given a whopping 800 mg of DHA a day during pregnancy, infant girls exposed to the higher dose DHA in the womb had lower language scores and were more likely to have delayed language development than girls from women in the control group. So the absence of clear positive effects, along with the possible presence of negative effects in the children, raises the question whether DHA supplementation is justifiable. But it was a really large dose, suggesting that there may be an optimal DHA level below and above which DHA might be detrimental to the developing brain. So maybe too much is detrimental. What about too little? A systematic review of randomized controlled trials of DHA supplementation of pregnant and breastfeeding women failed to find any clear and consistent short- or long-term benefit for psychomotor, mental, visual, or physical development. Maybe DHA supplementation during pregnancy has no effect because the body isn't stupid and protects the growth of the baby's brain by drying off maternal stores of DHA, upregulating maternal DHA synthesis, and preferentially shuttling it to the fetus. But what if moms don't start out with large maternal stores? In other words, maybe DHA failed to help women who are already getting enough, but maybe women with very low intakes would benefit from DHA supplementation. Well, first it's interesting to note that even by 1978, researchers were suggesting plant-based diets as the diet of choice in the treatment of our number one killer. But babies breastfed by vegan moms have significantly less DHA in their bloodstream, presumably because the moms had significantly less DHA in their breast milk. The question is whether these differences are of any consequence. The growth and development of vegan and vegetarian children are normal, as long as they're getting their B12. 
no evidence that neural or intellectual functions are impaired. In fact, the two studies we have on vegetarian kids showed that they had higher IQs, though that may have been because their parents tended to be better educated. But even though the kids seem fine, that doesn't rule out the possibility that there may be some subtle differences in visual or neural functioning. It'd be interesting to compare the function of babies getting vegan breast milk levels versus general population levels. You can see vegans had 14, vegetarians 30, omnivores 37. This study compared 0 to 32, 64, and 96, and 32 worked better than 0, but more than 32 didn't add anything. Uh, this could explain why the general population at 37 doesn't benefit from additional DHA supplementation. But what about down at 14? Uh, most studies down, down at that level showed no advantage over 0, though one study found a benefit supplementing at as low as 5, but th that doesn't help us. Now, just because babies breastfed by vegan moms have significantly lower DHA levels in the blood doesn't necessarily mean they have lower levels in their brain, which is where it counts. Uh, what we need is a randomized controlled trial in non-fish eaters of DHA supplementation. Until then, it's going to remain uncertain. So what should pregnant and breastfeeding women who avoid fish do in the meanwhile? Low intakes of DHA doesn't necessarily equate with fetal DHA inadequacy, but this new data suggests that some infants may not be getting enough and could benefit from their moms supplementing. And so I recommend pregnant and breastfeeding women on plant-based diets do follow the consensus guidelines to get about 200 mg of preformed DHA from an uncontaminated source like algae oil, which is probably the best combination for all women, given the state of our world, to minimize exposure to toxic pollutants such as dioxins, PCBs, and mercury. The CDC recently celebrated the 50-year anniversary of the landmark 1964 Surgeon General's report on smoking, considered one of the greatest public health achievements of our time, the first of 30 other such reports from the Surgeon General on smoking. Internal tobacco industry memos document their response. Major criticisms of the report include a cavalier treatment of the costs of smoking. The Surgeon General argued that smoking costs our nation billions, but the tobacco industry notes that smoking saves the country money by increasing the number of people dying soon after retirement, so we don't have to pay for, like, Social Security, Medicare. In fact, if we were truly patriotic, maybe we should be encouraging smoking to help balance the budget. But they also criticized the Surgeon General for a lack of balance regarding the benefits of smoking. One has to search pretty hard to find any concession anywhere in the report that smoking is not all bad, something the tobacco industry liked to bring up when testifying before Congress. Health benefits include the feeling of well-being, satisfaction, and happiness, and everything else. But beyond just all the happiness the Surgeon General was trying to extinguish, he failed to even mention that smokers appear protected against Parkinson's disease. More than 50 studies over the last half century quite unexpectedly showed that tobacco use is associated with a lower incidence of Parkinson's disease, now up to more than five dozen studies. Uh, yeah, but smokers are probably dying off before they even have a chance to get Parkinson's. No, that did not seem to be it. They found a protective effect at all ages. Maybe it's because smokers tend to be coffee drinkers. We know coffee consumption alone appears protective. But no, the protective effect of smoking remained even after carefully controlling for coffee intake. Maybe we inherit some propensity to both not smoke and get Parkinson's. If only we could like clone someone to have the same DNA. We can. They're called identical twins. And still, the relationship remained, suggesting a true biologic protective effect of cigarette smoking. Not so fast. Maybe finding unusually low rates of Parkinson's among smokers is an example of reverse causation. Maybe smoking doesn't protect against Parkinson's. Maybe 
Parkinson's protects against smoking. Maybe there's something about a Parkinson's brain that makes it easier to quit. Or maybe failure to develop a smoking habit in the first place is an early manifestation of the disease. To put that to the test, researchers studied children exposed to their parents' smoke. Now, if they grew up to have less Parkinson's, then that would confirm the protective link, and indeed they did. So smoking really does seem protective against a Parkinson's disease, but who cares? How does that help us? I mean, more than 20 million Americans have died as a result of smoking since the first Surgeon General's report. So even if we didn't care about dying from lung cancer and emphysema, even if we just cared about our brain, we still wouldn't smoke, because smoking is a significant risk factor for having a stroke as well. So why do I even bring this up? Unless there was a way we could get the benefits of smoking without the risks through our diet, Parkinson's disease is a movement disorder striking 1% of our older population and is the 14th leading cause of death in the United States. Uh, we don't really know what causes it, but we do know that people with a smoking history only appear to have about half the risk. Of course, smoking is hugely damaging to health. Any benefit derived from a reduction in the risk of Parkinson's is far outweighed by the increased risk of cancer, heart, and lung disease. But this shouldn't stop us from evaluating tobacco components for possible neuroprotective effects, and nicotine may fit the bill. If nicotine is the agent responsible for the neuroprotective effects, is there any way to get the benefit without the risks? Well, where does nicotine come from? The tobacco plant. Any other plants have nicotine? Well, tobacco is a nightshade. That means tobacco, tomatoes, potatoes, eggplants, and peppers are all in the same family. And guess what? They all contain nicotine as well. That's why you can't tell if someone's a smoker just by looking for the presence of nicotine in their toenail clippings, because non-smokers grow out some nicotine into their nails as well. It's in our daily diet. But how much? The amount we average in our diet is hundreds of times less than we get from a single cigarette, so though we've known for 15 years that there's nicotine in ketchup, it was dismissed as insignificant. But then we learned that even just one or two puffs of a cigarette could saturate half of our brain's nicotine receptors, so it doesn't take much. Then we learned that even just exposure to secondhand smoke may lower the risk of Parkinson's, and there's not much nicotine in that. In fact, one would only be exposed to like 3 micrograms of nicotine working in some smoky restaurant, but that's on the same order as what one might get eating food at a non-smoking restaurant. So the contribution of dietary nicotine intake, just eating some healthy vegetables, may be significant. So researchers decide to put it to the test. Looking at nightshade consumption in general, they may be found a lower risk compared to other vegetables, but different nightshades have different amounts of nicotine. They found none in eggplant, only a little in potatoes, some in tomatoes, but the most in bell peppers. And so when that was taken into account, a much stronger picture emerged. They found that more peppers meant more protection. And as we might expect, the effects of eating nicotine-containing foods was mainly evident in non-smokers, as the nicotine from smoke would presumably blot out any dietary effect. So this could explain why protective associations have been found for Parkinson's in the consumption of tomatoes, potatoes, and a tomato and pepper-rich Mediterranean diet. Might nightshade vegetables also help with treating Parkinson's? Well, results from trials of nicotine gum and patches has been patchy, so maybe nicotine only helps prevent it in the first place, or maybe it's not the nicotine at all, but some other phytochemical in the tobacco and pepper family. They conclude that their findings will need to be reproduced to help establish cause and effect before considering dietary interventions to prevent Parkinson's disease, but when the dietary intervention is like eat more yummy healthy dishes like stuffed peppers with tomato sauce, I don't see the reason we have to wait. There are toxicological issues associated with production and processing of meat issues 
like the presence of various toxic contaminants, from dioxins and PCBs to the cooked meat carcinogens. Carcinogenesis, the development of cancer, may be the main concern, but there's a number of other toxic responses connected with the consumption of meat products. Lead, for example, can be toxic to the nerves, gastrointestinal tract, bone marrow, and kidneys. Where is lead found in the food supply? In general terms, the highest levels of lead, as well as arsenic and mercury, were found in fish. Uh, sardines have the most arsenic, but tuna may have sardines beat when it comes to mercury and lead. The problem is that fish consumption advisories related to human health protection do not consider the fish byproducts fed to farmed animals like farmed fish. If some tilapia is fed tuna byproducts, they could bioaccumulate heavy metals and pass them on to us. The highest levels have been found in frozen sole fillets, averaging above the legal limit for lead. Lead exposure has been shown to have adverse effects on nearly every organ system in the body. Symptoms of chronic exposure range from memory loss and constipation to impotence and depression. This is all after Pretty hefty exposure, though, but we now know that blood lead levels in the range currently considered acceptable are associated with increased prevalence of gout and hyperuricemia, elevated levels of uric acid in the blood. According to the Centers for Disease Control and World Health Organization, a blood lead level less than 25 uh, micrograms per deciliter uh, to be not elevated. And so you'd assume that at all these values under 25, there'd be no relationship with health outcomes. But even throughout this quote-unquote acceptable range, lower lead meant lower uric acid levels and lower gout risk. So even blood lead levels 20 times below the acceptable level can be associated with increased prevalence of gout. Uh, these data suggest that there's no such thing as a safe level of exposure to lead. And once it gets into the body, it tends to stay in the body. It builds up in the bones such that it may take 30 years just to get rid of half, so the best strategy would be not get exposed in the first place. If it builds up in bones, though, what about boiling bones for broth? Uh, we know bones sequester lead, and such lead can then leach from the bones, so they figured that bone broth made from the bones of farmyard animals might carry a risk of being contaminated with lead. Who eats bone broth? Bone broth consumption is encouraged by many advocates of the paleo diet. Online you can learn all about the benefits of bone broth, but what they don't mention is the theoretical risk of lead contamination, or at least it was theoretical until now. Broth made from chicken bones was found to have markedly high lead concentrations, up to tenfold increase in lead. In view of the dangers of lead consumption to the human body, they recommend that doctors and nutritionists take the risk of lead contamination into consideration when advising patients about bone broth diets. Uh, but what if you only use bones from organic, free-range chickens? They did only use bones from organic, free-range chickens. Most of the attention on phthalates, a group of hormone-disrupting chemicals found in PVC plastics, has been on fetal and child health, particularly regarding genital and behavioral development, such as incomplete virilization in infant boys and reduced masculine play as they grow up, and for girls, an earlier onset of puberty. But what about affecting hormonal function in adults? Men exposed to high levels of phthalate have lower testosterone levels, but this is for workers in a plastics plant. In the general population, the evidence is mixed. A study in Sweden of men in their 20s found no effect on testosterone, whereas a U.S. study on men in their 30s did, at levels of exposure much lower than those factory workers. When there's conflicting evidence like this, ideally we'd put it to the test, but you can't you know, ethically expose people. 
So scientists have come up with convoluted methods like implanting the testicles from human fetuses into mice to keep them growing, uh, but we want to know about the effects on adult testicles, which are harder to procure until now. Consent was obtained from all the donors. Now I've heard of blood donors, but this is a whole nother level. Uh, no, they, uh, they obtained the testicles from prostate cancer patients who underwent castration to control their disease. And indeed, we're able to get direct evidence that phthalates can inhibit testosterone production at the kinds of levels one sees in general population studies. What about breast cancer, the number one cancer killer of young women? Women working in automotive plastics and food canning are at five times the odds of breast cancer, suggesting a link, but in a petri dish at least, phthalates didn't seem to accelerate breast cancer growth down at the levels of exposure expected in the general population, but more recently was found to boost breast cancer growth in vitro at the levels found circulating in the bodies of many women. Therefore, the maximum tolerable dose set by governments should be reevaluated. How do you avoid this stuff? Well, when you think plastic chemicals, you think water bottles, but they appear to only play a minor role. Most comes from food. How do we know? Well, if you take people and have them stop eating for a few days, you get a significant drop in the amount of phthalates spilling out into their urine. Fasting isn't exactly sustainable, though, thankfully, we can see similar drops just eating a plant-based diet for a few days, which gives us a clue as to where most phthalates are found, though there were a few cases of spikes within the fasting period after showers, suggesting contamination in personal care products as well. So we can counsel patients to reduce phthalate exposures by avoiding the use of scented personal care products, soap, and cosmetics, since phthalates are used as a fragrance carrier. Phthalates can also be found in children's toys as well as adult toys. On behalf of the Danish Environmental Protection Agency, the Danish Technological Institute made inquiries about consumption patterns to see what kind of exposure one might get based on worst-case scenarios. Those working behind the counters at sex shops proved to possess very little knowledge on the material specifications, and so they had to do their own testing. Uh, it turns out that the quote-unquote jelly is plasticized PVC up to two-thirds phthalates by weight, though the use of water-based lubricants may reduce the health risks a hundredfold. They still may have the opposite of the intended effect. Women with the highest levels of phthalates flowing through their bodies had uh, over two and a half times the odds of reporting a lack of interest in sexual activity. And these weren't women in a canning factory, but at typical exposure levels in America. Why does switching from white rice to brown rice enable overweight individuals to significantly reduce their weight, their waist size, their blood pressure, and the level of inflammation within their bodies. We think it might be the fiber. Uh, brown rice has four times as much dietary fiber as white, including prebiotic types that foster the growth of our good bacteria, which may help account for the anti-obesity effects of brown rice. Besides the prebiotic fiber, there's all sorts of vitamins and minerals that are lost when brown rice is milled into white, along with phytonutrients such as gamma arisinol, which may theoretically help shift one's preferences to healthier foods. And there are also petri dish studies that suggest it may help lower cholesterol, and along with other compounds found in rice bran, which is what makes brown rice brown, may inhibit human cancer cell growth through antioxidant means, antiproliferative and pro-cancer cell suicide mechanisms, immune system modulation, and increasing barrier protection. But again, this is all just in test tubes, not people. There are two human studies, though. The Adventist Health Study found that brown rice is one of four foods associated with significantly decreased risk of colorectal polyps, which can turn into colorectal cancer. Eating cooked green vegetables every day was associated with a 24% lower risk, 
as much as dried fruit just three times a week. Eating beans, chickpeas, split peas, or lentils at least three times a week was associated with a 33% lower risk, but brown rice seemed to garner 40% lower risk, and that was just a single serving a week or more. The other study reported increased muscle strength after supplementation with the brown rice compound in hopes that it could provide a side-effect-free alternative to anabolic steroids. Uh, but the dose they were giving is equivalent to like 17 cups of brown rice a day, so it's not clear if it works at practical doses. Naturally pigmented rice, such as black rice or red rice, may be even more nutritious than brown. During the last decade, it's been shown that these natural anthocyanin plant pigments may have a variety of beneficial effects. They're what makes blueberries blue and uh, red cabbage red. Recent recognition of the fact that diets rich in plant foods lower the risks of cancer promotes enthusiasm for isolating these compounds as pharmaceutical agents. But why not just eat the blueberries, or add some red cabbage to your stir-fry atop some colorful rice? Black, purple, and red rice and their pigment compounds have been shown in a variety of antioxidant, anti-cancer, anti-heart disease, anti-diabetes, anti-allergy activities. But these are all studies done in the lab. We don't yet have clinical studies, but they have everything that brown rice has, plus five times more antioxidants and all these extra goodies. So that's why I always cook red, black, or purple uh, rice, or rather my rice cooker does, always with a handful of lentils or split peas thrown in for good measure, since they cook in the same time frame. But why don't most people even choose brown over white? Well, brown doesn't last as long on the shelves, so it can actually be more expensive, even though it's less processed, whereas white rice is like apocalypse food, even putting Twinkies to shame, still edible after 30 years, though by then may have a slight Play-Doh odor. All nutrients come from the sun, or the soil. Vitamin D, the sunshine vitamin, is created when skin is exposed to sunlight. Everything else comes from the ground. Minerals originate from the earth, and vitamins from the plants and microorganisms that grow from it. The calcium in a cow's milk, and her 200-pound skeleton, came from all the plants she ate, which drew it up from the soil. We can cut out the middle moo, though, and get calcium from the plants directly. Where do you get your protein? Protein contains essential amino acids, meaning our bodies can't make them, and so are essential to get from our diet. But other animals don't make them either. All essential amino acids originate from plants and microbes, and all plant proteins have all essential amino acids. The only truly incomplete protein in the food supply is gelatin, which is uh, missing the amino acid tryptophan. Uh, so the only protein source that you couldn't live on is... Jello. As I covered previously, those eating plant-based diets average about twice the average requirement for protein. Those who don't know where to get protein on a plant-based diet don't know beans. Get it? That's protein quantity, though. What about protein quality? The concept that plant protein was inferior to animal protein arose from studies performed on rodents more than a century ago. Scientists found that infant rats don't grow as well on plants, but infant rats don't grow as well on human breast milk either. So does that mean we shouldn't breastfeed our babies? Ridiculous. They're rats. Rat milk has 10 times more protein than human milk, because rats grow about 10 times faster than human infants. It's true that some plant proteins are relatively low in certain essential amino acids, so about 40 years ago the myth of protein combining came into vogue. Literally, the February 75 issue of Vogue magazine. The concept was that we needed to eat complementary proteins together, for example, rice and beans, to make up for their relative shortfalls. This fallacy was refuted decades ago, the myth, 
that plant proteins are incomplete, that plant proteins aren't as good, that one has to combine proteins at meals. These have all been dismissed by the nutrition community as myths decades ago. But many in medicine evidently didn't get the memo. Dr. John McDougall called out the American Heart Association for a 2001 publication that questioned the completeness of plant proteins. Thankfully, though, they changed and acknowledge now that plant proteins can provide all the essential amino acids, no need to combine complementary proteins. It turns out our body is not stupid. It maintains pools of free amino acids that can be used to do all the complementing for us, not to mention the massive protein recycling program our body has. Some 90 grams of protein is dumped into the digestive tract every day from our own body to get broken back down and reassembled, so our body can mix and match amino acids to whatever proportions we need, whatever we eat making it practically impossible to even design a diet of whole plant foods that's sufficient in calories but deficient in protein. Thus, plant-based consumers do not need to be at all concerned about amino acid imbalances from the plant proteins that make up our usual diets. The two most prominent dietary risks for death and disability in the world are not eating enough fruit and eating too much salt. Too little fruit kills nearly 5 million people every year. Too much salt kills 4 million. There are three things we can do to lower our salt intake. First, don't add salt at the table. A third of us add salt to our food before even tasting it. Number two, stop adding salt when cooking. At first, the food will taste bland. Two to four weeks later, however, as the sensitivity of the salt taste receptors in the mouth become more sensitive to the taste of salt in the usual concentrations. Uh, believe it or not, but after two weeks you may actually prefer the taste of food with less salt. Some of the flavorings you can use instead in the meanwhile, instead of salt, include using uh, more pepper, onion, garlic, tomato, sweet peppers, basil, parsley, thyme, celery, and lime. Uh, chili, nettle, rosemary, smoke flavor, curry, coriander, and lemon. Even if you did add salt, though, it's probably better than eating out, where even at non-fast food restaurants they tend to pile it on. And finally, avoid processed foods that have salt added. In most countries, only about half of sodium intake comes from processed foods, so there's more personal responsibility. But in the U.S., even if we completely stopped adding salt in the kitchen and dining room, it would still only bring down salt intake a small fraction. This has led public health commentators to note how challenging it is then for everyone to re reduce their salt intake, since so much of our sodium intake is out of our control. But is it? Uh, we don't have to buy all those processed foods. We can choose not to turn over our family's health to food corporations that may not have our best interests at heart. If we do buy processed foods, there are two tricks we can use. Try to only buy foods with fewer milligrams of sodium on the label than there are grams in the serving size. So if it's a 100 gram serving size, it should have less than 100 milligrams of sodium. Or you can shoot for fewer milligrams of sodium than there are calories. For example, here the sodium is 720, calories are 260. 720 is greater than 260, so this has too much sodium. And that's a trick I learned from one of my favorite dietitians of all time, Jeff Novick. Uh, the reason it works is because most people get around 2,200 calories a day, so if everything you ate had more calories than sodium, you'd at least slip under the 2,300 milligrams of sodium upper limit for healthy people under age 50. Of course, the healthiest foods have no labels at all. We should try to buy as much fresh food as possible as it's almost impossible to come up with a diet consisting of unprocessed natural foodstuffs that exceeds the strict American Heart Association guidelines for sodium reduction. Neuropathy, or damage to the nerves, is a debilitating disorder. Diabetes is by far the most common cause. Up to 50% of diabetics will eventually develop neuropathy during the course of their disease. 
can be very painful, and the pain is frequently resistant to conventional treatments. In fact, there are currently considered no effective treatment for diabetic neuropathy. Clinicians rely on steroids, opiates, and antidepressants to try to mediate the suffering. But 20 years ago, a remarkable study was published on the regression of diabetic neuropathy with a plant-based diet. There are two types of diabetic neuropathy, a relatively painless type, characterized by numbness, tingling, and pins and needle sensations, and then a second form, which is painful, with burning or aching sensations to the point of excruciating, lancinating, stabbing pain. This study concentrated on the painful type. 21 diabetics suffering with moderate or worse symptomatic painful neuropathy for up to 10 years were placed on a whole food plant-based diet, along with a half hour of walking every day. Years and years of suffering, and then complete relief of pain in 17 out of the 21 patients within days. Numbness noticeably improved too, and the side effects were all good. They lost 10 pounds, blood sugars got better, insulin needs dropped in half, and in five of the patients, not only apparently was their painful neuropathy cured, so was their diabetes, normal blood sugars off of all medications and their triglycerides and cholesterol improved too. High blood pressure got better, in fact gone in about half the hypertensives, an 80% drop overall in the need for high blood pressure medications within three weeks. Now this was a live-in program where patients' meals were provided. What happened when they were sent home? The 17 folks were followed for years, and in all except one, the relief from the painful neuropathy continued or improved even farther. How'd they get that kind of compliance? Pain and ill health are strong, motivating factors. One of the most painful and frustrating conditions to treat in all of medicine, and 75% cured in a couple days with a natural, non-toxic, in fact beneficial treatment, a diet composed of whole plant foods. How could nerve damage be reversed so suddenly? It wasn't necessarily the improvement in blood sugar control, since it took about 10 days for the diet to control the diabetes, whereas the pain was gone in as few as four days. Well, there are several mechanisms by which a total vegetarian diet works to alleviate the problem of diabetic neuropathy, as well as the diabetic condition itself. Their most interesting speculation was that it could be the trans fats, naturally found in meat and dairy and refined vegetable oils, that could be causing an inflammatory response. They found a significant percentage of the fat found under the skin of those who ate meat or dairy consisted of trans fats, whereas those on a strictly whole food plant-based diet had none. They stuck needles in the buttocks of people eating different diets, and nine months or more on a strict plant-based diet appeared to remove the trans fat from their bodies, or at least their butts. Uh, but their pain didn't take nine months to get better, it got better in days, so more likely it was due to an improvement in blood flow. Nerve biopsies in diabetics with severe progressive neuropathy have shown small vessel disease within the nerve. There are blood vessels within our nerves that can get clogged up. The oxygen levels in the nerves of diabetics was found to be lower than even that of deoxygenated blood. This lack of oxygen within the nerve may arise from blockages within the blood vessels, depriving the nerve of oxygen, presumably leading them to cry out in pain. Within days, though, improvements in blood rheology, the ease of blood flow on a plant-based diet, may play a prominent role in the reversal of diabetic neuropathy. Plant-based diets may also lower the level of IGF-1 inside the eyeballs of diabetics and decrease the risk of retinopathy, diabetic vision loss as well. But the most efficient way to avoid diabetic complications is to eliminate the diabetes. And this is often feasible for those type 2 patients who make an abiding commitment to daily exercise and a healthy enough diet. Since the initial report, of neuropathy reversal. The results have been replicated. Significant improvements in numbness and burning. Why didn't I learn about this in medical school? The neglect of this important work by the broader medical community is nothing short of unconscionable. Vinegar has evidently been used as a weight loss aid for nearly 200 years, but does it work? 
Well, like hot sauce, it can be a nearly calorie-free way to flavor foods, and there's all sorts of tasty exotic vinegars out there now, like fig, peach, and pomegranate to choose from. But the question is, is there something special about vinegar that helps with weight loss? Vinegar is defined simply as a dilute solution of acetic acid, which takes energy for our body to metabolize, activating an enzyme called AMPK, which is like our body's fuel gauge. If it senses that we're low, it amps up energy production, tells the body to stop storing fat, and start burning fat. And so given our obesity epidemic, it's crucial that oral compounds with high bioavailability are developed to safely induce chronic AMPK enzyme activation, which would potentially be beneficial for long-term weight loss. No need to develop such a compound, though, if you can buy it at any grocery store. We know vinegar can activate AMPK in human cells, but is the dose one might get sprinkling it on a salad enough? If you take endothelial cells, uh, blood vessel lining cells from umbilical cords after baby or babies are born, and expose them to various levels of acetate, which is what the acetic acid in vinegar turns into in our stomach, it appears to take a uh, uh, concentration of at least 100 to get a really significant boost in AMPK. So how much acetate do you get in your bloodstream, sprinkling about a tablespoon of vinegar on your salad? You do it 100, but only for about 15 minutes. And even at that concentration, 10 or 20 minutes exposure doesn't seem to do much. Now, granted this is in a Petri dish, but we didn't have any clinical studies until we did. A double-blind trial investigating the effects of vinegar intake on reduction of body fat in overweight men and women. Now, they call them obese, but they were actually slimmer than your average American. In Japan, they call anything over a BMI of 25 obese, whereas the average American adult is about 28.6. Uh, but anyway, they took about 150 overweight individuals and randomly split them into one of three groups. A high-dose vinegar group, where they drank a beverage containing two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar a day. A low-dose group, where they drank a beverage containing only one tablespoon of apple cider vinegar a day. And a placebo control group, where they had them drink an acidic beverage they developed to taste the same as the vinegar drink, but using a different kind of acid, so there was no acetic acid. No other changes in their diet or exercise. In fact, they monitored their diets and gave them all pedometers so to make sure that the only significant difference between the three groups was the amount of vinegar they were getting every day. This is where they started out. And within just one month, statistically significant drops in weight in both vinegar groups compared to placebo, with higher dose doing better than the low dose, which just got better and better month after month. In fact, by month three, the do-nothing placebo group actually gained weight, as overweight people tend to do, whereas the vinegar group significantly dropped their weight. Now, was the weight loss actually significant or just kind of statistically significant? Well, uh, that's for you to decide. This is in kilograms. So compared to placebo, the two tablespoons of vinegar a day group dropped five pounds by the end of 12 weeks. That may not sound like a lot, but they got that for just pennies a day without removing anything from their diet. And they got slimmer up to nearly an inch off their waist, suggesting they were losing abdominal fat, but the researchers went the extra mile and put it to the test. They put the research subjects through abdo abdominal CT scans to actually directly measure the amount of fat before and after in their bodies. They measured the amount of superficial fat, visceral fat, and total body fat. Superficial fat is the fat under your skin that makes for flabby arms and contributes to cellulite, but visceral fat is the killer. That's the fat, shown here in white, building up around your internal organs that bulges out the belly. And that's the kind of fat the placebo group was putting on when they were gaining weight. Not good. But both the low-dose and high-dose vinegar groups were able to remove about a square inch of visceral fat off that CT scan slice. Uh, now, like any weight loss strategy, it only works if you do it. A month after they stopped the vinegar, the weight crept back up, but that's just additional evidence that the vinegar was working. But how? A group of researchers in the UK suggested an explanation. 
vinegar beverages are gross. <laughs> they made a so-called palatable beverage by uh, mixing a fruity syrup and vinegar and water, and then went out of their way to make a really nasty, unpalatable uh, vinegar beverage, both with white wine vinegar, which were so unpleasant the study subjects actually felt nauseous after drinking them, so ate less of the meal they gave it with. So there you go. Vinegar helps with both appetite control and food intake, though these effects were largely due to the fruity vinegar concoctions invoking feelings of nausea. So is that what was going on here? Were the vinegar groups just eating less? No the vinegar groups were eating about the same compared to placebo. Same diet, more weight loss, thanks perhaps, to the acetic acid's impact on AMPK. Now the CT scans make this a very expensive study, so I was not surprised it was funded by a company that sells vinegars, which is good since otherwise we wouldn't have these amazing data, but is also bad because it always leaves you wondering if the funding source somehow manipulated the results. But the nice thing about companies funding studies about healthy foods, whether it's some kiwi fruit company or the National Watermelon Promotion Board, watermelon.org, check it out, uh, is that I mean, what's the worst that can happen? Here, for example, if the findings turned out to be bogus, worst comes to worst, your salad would just be tastier. There was a famous study from Harvard published back in 99 that found that women who used oil and vinegar salad dressing about every day went on to have fewer than half the fatal heart attacks compared to women who hardly ever used it, less than half the risk of the number one killer of women. They figured it was the omega-3s in the oil that explained the benefit, but I know what you're thinking. Those who use salad dressing every day probably also eat salad every day. But no, they were able to adjust for vegetable intake, so it didn't appear to be the salad. But why does the oil get the credit, and not the vinegar? If only there was a way we could test that. Well, what about creamy salad dressing? They were also made from omega-3 rich oils like canola, in fact even more so than oil and vinegar dressing. So if it's the oil and not the vinegar, then creamy dressing would be protective too. But it's not. No significant decrease in fatal attack, heart attack rates, or non-fatal heart attack rates for that matter. Now, it could be the eggs or butterfat counteracting the benefits of the omega-3s, but maybe the vinegar is actually playing a role. But how? Well, if you're paying close attention, in the vinegar weight loss video, the title of that paper was Vinegar Intake Enhances Flow-Mediated Vasodilation via Upregulation of Endothelial Nitric Oxide Synthase Activity. In other words, Vinegar enhances arterial function by allowing our arteries to better dilate naturally by boosting the activity of the enzyme in our body that synthesizes nitric oxide, the open sesame signal to our arteries that improves blood flow. If you remember, acetate is cleared out of your blood within a half an hour after consuming a salad with a tablespoon of vinegar in it, apparently not enough time to boost the AMPK enzyme, but within just 10 minutes, uh, those kind of acetate levels can boost the activity of the nitric oxide synthesizing enzyme within human umbilical cord blood vessel cells in a petri dish. But, but what about in people? They measured the dilation of arteries in the arms of women after they had a tablespoon of rice vinegar, a tablespoon of brown rice vinegar, or a tablespoon of forbidden rice vinegar. In other words, vinegar made from black or purple rice. All the vinegars appeared to help, but it was the black rice one that most clearly pulled away from the pack. Black rice contains the same kind of anthocyanin and pigments that make some fruits and vegetables blue and purple, and may have independent benefits. For example, if you give someone a big blueberry smoothie containing the amount of anthocyanins in a cup and a half of wild blueberries, you get a nice spike in arterial function that lasts a couple hours. Thus, the maximum forearm blood flow in the forbidden rice vinegar intake group might be attributed to an additional or synergistic effect of anthocyanin with the acetate. But it could also just be the antioxidant power of anthocyanins, in which case balsamic vinegar which is made from red wine, may have a similar effect, as it was shown to have remarkably higher free radical scavenging activity than rice vinegar. Enough to counter the artery-constricting effects of a high-fat meal? 
well, we've known for you know, nearly 20 years that a single high-fat meal, sausage and egg McMuffins with deep-fried hash browns, can cripple our artery function, cutting the ability of our arteries to dilate normally in half within hours of it going into our mouths, compared to frosted flakes. Even with that massive unhealthy sugar load, no effect on the arteries because there's no fat. And not just animal fat we're talking about. A quarter cup of safflower oil had a similar effect. In fact, the very first study to show how bad fat was for our arteries basically dripped highly refined soybean oil into people's veins. But extra virgin olive oil isn't refined. Uh, we know some whole food sources of plant fat, such as nuts, actually improve artery function, whereas oils, including olive oil, worsen function. But they didn't specify extra virgin here. I mean, you can see, smell, taste the phytonutrients still left in extra virgin olive oil. Are they enough to maintain arterial function? <gasps> no. A significant drop in artery function within three hours of eating whole grain bread dipped in extra virgin olive oil. And the more fat in their blood, the worse their arteries did. Ah, but what if you ate the same meal but added balsamic vinegar on a salad? That seemed to protect the arteries from the effects of the fat. Now, balsamic vinegar is a product of red wine. Would you get the same benefits just drinking a glass of red wine? No. No improvement in arterial function after red wine. Huh. Why does balsamic vinegar work, but red wine not? Maybe it's because the red wine lacks the benefits of the acetic acid in vinegar, or maybe it's because the vinegar lacks the negative effects of the alcohol. And a third option might be it was the salad ingredients had nothing to do with the vinegar. To figure out this puzzle, all we'd have to do is test non-alcoholic wine, and non-alcoholic red wine worked. So maybe it was the grapes in balsamic vinegar, not the acetic acid. And indeed, if you eat a cup and a half, a cup and a quarter, of uh, seeded and seedless red, green, and blue-black grapes with your sausage and egg McMuffin, you can blunt the crippling of your arteries. So plants and their products may provide protection against the direct impairment in endothelial function, unless those products are oil or alcohol. A double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized study found that body weight and belly fat were significantly reduced adding just a single tablespoon of vinegar to one's daily diet. But is there any benefit if, to vinegar consumption if you're not overweight? Well, their triglycerides normalized, and on the two tablespoons a day dose there was a dip in blood pressure. Uh, but those effects may have just been because of the weight loss. Other than taste, is there any benefit to normal weight individuals sprinkling vinegar on their salad? What about vinegar for blood sugar control? If you feed people a massive amount of sugar, a half cup of table sugar, as their blood sugar spike, their artery function can become impaired. And the higher the blood sugars go, the more the arteries take a hit. There's a drug, though, that can block sugar absorption, and by blunting the blood sugar spike with the drug, you can prevent the arterial dysfunction, demonstrating that it's probably good for your heart if you don't have big blood sugar spikes after meals. And indeed, how high your blood sugar spike after a meal is a predictor for cardiovascular mortality. So do people who eat lots of high glycemic foods, like sugary foods and refined grains, tend to have more heart attacks and strokes? Yes and they appear more likely to get diabetes. Uh, but maybe people who eat lots of Frosted Flakes and Wonder Bread also have other bad dietary habits. The diets that have been put to the test in randomized controlled trials and proven to prevent diabetes are the ones focusing on cutting down on saturated fat and ramping up the consumption of fiber-rich whole plant foods, such as fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, without specific regard to lower or higher glycemic loads. The drug has been put to the test, though, and blunting one's mealtime blood sugar spikes does seem to reduce the risk of developing diabetes, as well as reduce the risk of heart attacks and high blood pressure. So is there any way to prevent these blood sugar spikes without having to take drugs? Well, one way would be to not sit down to a half a cup of sugar. Yes, the drug can slow the progression of your atherosclerosis, 
instead of the arteries going to your brain narrowing this fast on the drug, they only narrow this fast. But wouldn't it be better to eat a diet that actually reverses heart disease, reverses diabetes? The healthiest diet to prevent the meal-related blood sugar and fat spikes, the oxidation, inflammation, is a diet centered around whole plant foods. But what if you really want a bagel? Instead of spreading drugs on it, spreading on some almond butter may help blunt the blood sugar spike from refined carbs. And another option is to dip your baguette in some balsamic vinegar. The consumption of vinegar with meals was evidently used as a home remedy for diabetes before drugs came along, but wasn't put to the test until 1988. After all, how much money can be made from vinegar? Well, according to the Vinegar Institute, millions of dollars, but a single diabetes drug, like Resulin, can pull in billions. Uh, before it was pulled from the market for killing too many people by shutting down their livers. The drug company still made off like a bandit, having to pay out less than a billion to the grieving families for covering up the danger. No liver failure from a peanut butter smeared bagel, though, cutting the blood sugar response in half, and the same with vinegar. If you chug down four teaspoons of apple cider vinegar diluted in water, you get that same blunting of the spike, and you get the additional advantage over the nuts of lowering insulin levels in the blood, something peanut butter apparently can't do, but presumably better than a bagel with locks, as fish causes triple the insulin response, or red wine, which also increases insulin levels, though not as much as the fish and also shoots up triglycerides, though de-alcoholized red wine, non-alcoholic wine, doesn't have the same problem. Okay, but what about vinegar? Not only may a tablespoon a day tend to improve cholesterol and triglycerides over time, vinegar can drop triglycerides within an hour of a meal, along with decreased blood sugars and the insulin spike, potentially offering the best of all worlds. Consuming vinegar with a meal reduces the spike in blood sugar, insulin, and triglycerides, and it appears to work particularly well in those who are insulin resistant on their way to type 2 diabetes. No wonder the consumption of vinegar with meals was used as a folk medicine for the treatment of diabetes before diabetes drugs were invented. Many cultures have taken advantage of this fact, mixing vinegar with high glycemic foods like white rice in Japan, for example, to make sushi, and dipping bread in balsamic in the Mediterranean, a variety of sourdough breads throughout Europe, which cause less blood sugar and insulin spikes. And you can do the same with boiled white potatoes by adding vinegar and cooling them down to make potato salad. Adding vinegar to white bread doesn't just lower blood sugar and insulin responses, but increases satiety, the feeling of being full after a meal. If you eat three slices of white bread, it may fill you up a little, but in less than two hours, not only are you as hungry as you started, but actually hungrier, less satiated than when you began. But if you eat the same amount of bread with some vinegar, you feel twice as full, and even two hours later you're still feeling nearly just as full as if you just ate the three pieces of bread plain. But this remarkable increase in prolongation of satiety took nearly two tablespoons of vinegar. That's a lot of vinegar. Turns out even just small amounts of vinegar, two teaspoons with a meal, can significantly cut down on the blood sugar spike of a refined carb meal, uh, bagel and juice in this case. So you could have a little side salad, or even just adding it to some tea with lemon. I mean, it's only two teaspoons. Or scrap the bagel with juice and just have some oatmeal with berries instead. What if you consume vinegar every day for months? Researchers at Arizona State randomized pre-diabetics to drink a daily bottle of an apple cider vinegar drink, half bottle lunch, half bottle of supper, or take a apple cider vinegar tablet, which they pretty much considered a placebo control, uh, since while the bottle contains two tablespoons of vinegar, two tablets would only add up to about a third of a teaspoon a day. So they were in effect comparing about 40 spoonfuls of vinegar a week to two for 12 weeks. This is what happened. 
on the vinegar drink, fasting blood sugars dropped within a week. How significant is a drop of 16 points? A simple dietary tweak, a tablespoon of vinegar twice a day, worked better than the leading drugs, like glucophage and Avandia. This effect of vinegar is particularly noteworthy when the cost, access, and toxicities that are associated with pharmaceutical medications are considered, so safer, cheaper, and more effective. No wonder it's been used medicinally since antiquity. Interestingly, even the small, tiny amount of vinegar in pill form seemed to help a bit. <laughs> That's astonishing. And no, the study was not funded by the vinegar company. What about long-term vinegar use where it really counts? In diabetics. They were randomized to one of three groups. Two tablespoons of vinegar twice a day with lunch and supper. Uh, two dill pickles a day, which each contained a half tablespoon's worth of sugar. I mean, not sugar, excuse me, vinegar. Or an even smaller vinegar pill twice a day, each containing only one sixteenth of a teaspoon's worth of vinegar. So I wasn't surprised the pill didn't work, but neither did the pickles. And maybe the tablespoon a day isn't enough for diabetics? Uh, regardless, the vinegar did work, all the more impressive because the diabetics were mostly well controlled on medication and still saw an additional benefit from the vinegar. As I note in my chapter on greens, my book How Not to Die, uh, vinegar may be one condiment that's actually good for you. Randomized controlled trials involving both diabetic and non-diabetic individuals found that adding two little teaspoons of vinegar to a meal may improve blood sugar control, effectively blunting the blood sugar spike after a meal by about 20%. But how? Originally, we thought it was because vinegar delayed the gastric emptying rate, slowing the speed at which a meal leaves your stomach, which makes sense, because there's acid receptors in the first part of the small intestine where the stomach acid is neutralized, and so if there's excess acid, the body slows down stomach emptying to give the intestine time to buffer it all. So the acid in vinegar was thought to slow the rate at which food leaves the stomach, resulting in a blunted sugar spike. But then studies like this were published, where taking apple cider vinegar before bedtime resulted in lower blood sugars the next morning. How does that work? That's obviously not some acid-induced stomach-slowing effect. And indeed, anyone who actually went to the trouble of sticking an ultrasound probe on someone's stomach could have told you that. No difference in stomach-emptying times comparing vinegar to neutralized vinegar. So it's not just an acid effect. So we're back to square one. Studies like this offered the next clue. Vinegar appeared to have no effect on blood sugars, but this was after giving people a straight glucose solution. Glucose is a byproduct of sugar and starch digestion. And so if vinegar blunts the blood sugar spike from cotton candy and Wonder Bread, but not glucose, maybe it works by suppressing the enzymes that digest sugars and starches. And indeed, vinegar appears to block the enzyme that breaks down table sugar. But it wasn't just an acid effect. There appears to be something unique about acetic acid, the acid in vinegar. But this was based on intestinal cells in a petri dish. What about in people? Feed people some mashed potatoes with and without vinegar, and glucose flows into the bloodstream at the same rate either way. So that's another theory shot down. OK, so let's figure this out. If sugar enters the bloodstream at the same rate, with or without sugar, but vinegar leads to significantly less sugar in the blood, then logically it must be leaving the bloodstream faster. And indeed, vinegar ingestion appears to enhance sugar disposal by lowering insulin resistance, which is the cause of type 2 diabetes. And indeed, vinegar ingestion does appear to improve the action of insulin in diabetics. The mystery of how vinegar works appears to have been solved, at least in part. So diabetics can add vinegar to their mashed potatoes, or just not eat mashed potatoes. If you add vinegar to a high-fiber meal, nothing happens, explaining results like this. No effects of vinegar in diabetics in response to a meal. No surprise, because the meal was mostly beans. But if you're going to eat high glycemic index foods, like refined grains, vinegar can help, though there are some caveats. 
don't drink vinegar straight, as it may cause intractable hiccups, and can burn your esophagus as can apple cider vinegar tablets if they get lodged in your throat. Not that apple cider vinegar tablets necessarily actually have any apple cider vinegar in them at all. Don't pour it on your kid's head to treat head lice. It's not harmful, except when it leaps, leaks onto the face and penetrates the eyes. And it turns out it doesn't even work can cause third-degree burns if you soak a bandage with it and leave it on, though as many as a total of six tablespoons of day of vinegar was not associated with any side effects in the short term when ingested. Until we know more, though, maybe we'd want to stick with a more common culinary-type doses, like two tablespoons max a day. For example, drinking a total of 2,000 cups of vinegar was found to be a bad idea. What was the meat industry's response to these leading cancer charities' recommendation to stop eating processed meat, like bacon, ham, hot dog, sausage, and lunch meat, now considered a Class I carcinogen? Uh, they acknowledge that the most recent international cancer prevention guidelines now urge people to avoid processed meat. It's evident that such a statement represents a clear and present danger for the meat industry, reads one response in the journal Meat Science. Processed meat, they say, is a social necessity. How could anyone live without bologna? The challenge for the meat industry is to find a way to maintain the consumption of these convenience products while somehow not damaging public health. We're still not sure what it is in processed meat that's so carcinogenic, but the most probable educated guess for explaining the damaging effect of processed meats involve heme compounds, along with the nitrosamine and free radical formation, resulting ultimately in carcinogenic DNA damage. To reduce nitrosamines, they could remove the nitrites, something that the industry has been considering for decades because of the long-known toxic effects they cause. The industry adds them to keep the meat pink. There are evidently other coloring additives available. Nevertheless, it's going to be hard to get their industry to change in view of the positive effects of these substances as preservatives and desirable flavor and red color developing ingredients. No one wants green eggs and ham. It's like salt reduction in meat products. They'd like to, but one of the biggest barriers to salt replacement within the meat industry is cost, as salt is one of the cheapest food ingredients available. Now, there's a number of taste enhancers they can inject into the meat that can help compensate for the salt reduction but some leave a bitter aftertaste, so they can also inject a patented bitter-blocking chemical that can prevent taste nerve stimulation at the same time. The first of what may become a stream of products that are produced due to the convergence of food technology and biotech. Or they could always try adding non-meat materials to the meat. You could add fiber or resistant starch from beans that have protective effects against cancer. I mean, after all, in the United States dietary fiber is under-consumed by most adults, indicating that fiber fortification in meat products could have health benefits. Failing to note, of course, that their products are one of the reasons the American diet is so deficient in fiber in the first place. The industry is all in favor of reformulating their products to cause less cancer, but obviously any such optimization has to achieve a healthier product without affecting the hedonic aspects. It's important to realize that nutritional and technological quality in the meat industry are inversely related. An improvement in one will lead to a deterioration of the other. Uh, they know the consumption of lard is not the best thing in the world, and heart disease being our number one killer and all. However, those downsides are in sharp contrast to their technological qualities that make them indispensable in the manufacture of meat products. Otherwise, you just don't get the same lard consistency. The pig's fat just doesn't get hard enough and as a result, a fatty smear upon cutting or slicing can be observed on the cutting surface of the knife. So yeah, less heart disease, but you got to weigh the pros and cons. 
In the light of strikingly consistent observations from many population-based studies, there can be little doubt that the habitual consumption of diets high in fruits and vegetables helps reduce the risk of development of degenerative diseases, including many types of cancers. Not satisfied with just telling people to eat their fruits and veggies, scientists want to know the mechanism. Fruits and vegetables are not just vehicles for antioxidants. They contain innumerable phytonutrients that can boost our detoxification enzymes, modulate gene expression, and even DNA repair. Until fairly recently, it was generally assumed that functions as important as DNA repair were unlikely to be readily affected by nutrition. But if you compare identical twins to fraternal twins, only about half to three-quarters of DNA repair function is genetically determined. The rest we may be able to control. It's estimated that on average there are 800 incidents of DNA damage in our bodies per hour. That's 19,000 hits to our DNA every day, and that DNA damage can cause mutations that can give rise to cancer if not repaired. Thankfully, the regulation of DNA repair may be added to the list of biological processes that are influenced by what we eat, and specifically that this might constitute part of the explanation for the cancer-preventive effects of many plant-based foods. Any plants in particular? Well, nine fruits and vegetables were tested to see which was better able to boost DNA repair. Lemons, persimmons, strawberries, oranges, choy some, which is like skinny bok choy, broccoli, celery, lettuce, and apples. Which ones made the cut? Want to guess? Lemons, persimmons, strawberries, broccoli, celery, and apples each confer DNA protection at very low doses. Here's what lemons could do, for example. Cuts DNA damage by about a third. Was it the vitamin C? No. Removing the vitamin C from the lemon extract did not remove the protective effect. However, if you boiled the lemon first for 30 minutes, the effect was lost. New data demonstrating a DNA protective agent was present in at least some fruits and vegetables found that it was heat-sensitive and determined it was not vitamin C, confirmed in a study that tried vitamin C directly and found no effect on DNA protection and repair of DNA strand breaks. The carotenoid beta-cryptoxanthin, found primarily in citrus, seems at least one candidate. If you expose cells to a mutagenic chemical, you can cause physical breaks in the strands of DNA, but in less than an hour our DNA repair enzymes can weld most of our DNA back together. But if you add some of that citrus phytonutrient, you can effectively double the speed at which DNA is repaired. But this is all just cells in a petri dish. What about in a person? If you have people drink a glass of orange juice and draw their blood two hours later, the DNA damage you can induce with an oxidizing chemical drops, whereas if they just had like orange Kool-Aid, didn't help. So do people who eat more fruit walk around with less DNA damage? Yes, particularly in women. Does this actually translate into lower cancer rates? It appears so. Citrus alone associated with a 10% reduction in odds of breast cancer. Given to newly diagnosed breast cancer patients, citrus phytonutrients were found to concentrate in breast tissue, uh, though many complained of citrus burps uh, due to the concentrated extract they were given. So researchers evaluated topical application as an alternative dosing strategy, uh, recruiting women to apply orange-flavored massage oil to their breasts daily. This request was met with excellent compliance, but it didn't work. We actually have to eat our food. Why not just take carotenoid supplements to boost our DNA repair? Because it doesn't work. Although dietary supplements did not provoke any alteration in DNA repair, dietary supplementation with carrots did. And this suggests that the whole food may be important in modulating DNA repair processes. Though orange juice consumption was found protective against childhood leukemia, it was not found protective against skin cancer. However, the most striking feature was the protection purported by citrus peel consumption. Who eats orange peels? 
lots of people evidently. Just drinking orange juice may increase the risk of the most serious type of skin cancer. Daily consumption was associated with a 60% increase in risk. So again, better to stick with the whole fruit, and you can eat citrus extra whole by zesting peel into your dishes. Resting metabolic rate is the largest component of our daily energy budget. Uh, the direct effects of physical activity are relatively small compared to how many calories we expend just living and breathing. Now, during like special ops training or climbing a four-mile high mountain, you may burn 4,000 calories a day, but uh, for most people, calories we burn just lying around existing exceeds normal physical activities. Thus, our metabolic rate can have implications for controlling our weight. Remember how dietary nitrate found in beets and green leafy vegetables improves the efficiency of the little power plants within our cells, boosting athletic performance by extracting more energy from every breath? Well, if we eat a lot of vegetables, might it slow our metabolism since our body can function so much more efficiently with the calories we give it? They gave people a dose of nitrate equivalent to a, a few servings of spinach or beets, and indeed their resting metabolic rate slowed on average about 4%. That's nearly 100 calories a day. If our bodies burned that many fewer calories a day and we didn't eat any less, we could put on a few pounds. Of course, green leafy vegetables are like the healthiest things on the planet, so we shouldn't decrease our greens intake to try to control our weight. But I think maybe it was a way our body evolved to use vegetables to help preserve energy during lean times in our ancient past. But this isn't just some kind of quirky interest. Slowing our metabolism may have benefits for our longevity. You know what else similarly slows your metabolism? Caloric restriction, like eating every other day. Uh, that may be one reason caloric restriction is associated with a longer lifespan in many animals. Maybe like a candle, burning with a smaller flame allows us to last longer. It's hard to walk around starving all the time, but it's easy to replicate that same metabolic benefit by eating a big daily salad. This may be by why one of the six most powerful things we can do to live longer may be eating green leafy vegetables, so not smoking, not heavily drinking, walking at least an hour a day, getting a good seven hours of sleep, and greens at least almost every day, in addition to achieving an ideal weight. Doing even just one of those may cut our risk of premature death by around 20 to 25 percent. Immanuel Kant, the 18th century philosopher, described the chemistry of his day as a science, but not really science, because it wasn't grounded in mathematics, at least not until a century later. The same could be said for biology, the study of life. In math and physics, quantum physics, there are constants, physical quantities thought to be both universal and unchanging. Biology, though, was considered too complex, too messy, to be governed by simple natural laws. But in 1999, a theoretical high-energy physicist from Los Alamos joined up with two biologists to describe universal scaling laws that appear to apply across the board. Are there any clinical implications of these kind of theories? Well, a fascinating observation was published. The number of heartbeats per lifetime is remarkably similar, whether you're a hamster <laughs> all the way up to a whale. So even though mice only live less than two years, their heart rate is like five to 600 beats a minute, up to 10 beats a second, whereas the heart of a Galapagos tortoise beats 100 times slower, but they live about 100 times longer. There's such a remarkable consistency in the number of heartbeats animals get in their lifetimes that a provocative question was asked. Can human life be expected extended by cardiac slowing. In other words, if humans are predetermined to have about 3 billion heartbeats period in a lifetime, then would a reduction in average heart rate extend life? This is not just some academic question. If that's how it worked, then one might estimate that a reduction in heart rate from more 
of an average you know, 70 beats per minute down to what many athletes have, 60 beats per minute, could theoretically increase lifespan over a decade. Seems a bit off the wall, but that's how the scientific method works. You start out with an observation, like this striking heartbeat data, and then you make an educated guess or hypothesis that you can then put to the test. How might one demonstrate a life-prolonging effect of cardiac slowing in humans? Well, perhaps a first attempt in this direction would be to see if people with low, you know, slower hearts live longer lives, uh, lamenting the fact that there's no drug that just lowered heart rate that they could give to people, since drugs like beta blockers lower heart rate, but also lower blood pressure, so it wouldn't be ideal for uh, testing the question at hand. But at least we could do that first part about do people with slower hearts live longer lives. And indeed, from the evidence accumulated so far, we know that a high resting heart rate, meaning how fast our heart beats when you're just sitting at rest, is associated with an increase in mortality in the general population, as well as those with chronic disease. A fasting heart rate may lead to a faster death rate. Faster resting heart rates are associated with shorter life expectancies, considered a strong independent risk factor for heart disease and heart failure. Uh, you can see how those with the higher heart rates are about twice as likely over the next 15 years to experience heart failure. In middle-aged people, and older people, in men, and women. And what's critical is that this link between how fast our heart goes and how fast our life goes is independent of physical activity. I mean, at first I was like, well, duh, of course lower resting heart rates are associated with a longer lifespan. Who has a really slow pulse? Athletes. As you can see, the more physically fit we are, the lower our resting pulse. But no, they found that irrespective of level of physical fitness, people with higher resting heart rates fare worse than people with lower heart rates. So it appears it's not just a marker of risk, but a bona fide risk factor, independent of how fit we are or how much we exercise. Why? Well, our heart rate is, if our heart rate is up you know, 24 hours a day, even when we're sleeping, all that pulsatile stress may break some of the elastic fibers within the arterial wall, causing our arteries to become stiff. It doesn't allow enough time for our arteries to relax between beats, and so the faster our heart, the stiffer our arteries. But there are all sorts of theories how an increased resting heart rate could decrease our time on Earth. Regardless, this relationship is now well recognized. It's not just a marker of an underlying pathology. It's not merely a marker of inflammation. Uh, the reason it's important to distinguish a risk factor from a risk marker is that if you control the risk factor, you control the risk. But if it's just a risk marker, it wouldn't matter if we brought our heart rate down. But now we even have evidence from drug trials, now that there actually are medications that just affect heart rate, that lowering our heart rate lowers our death rate. It's now been shown in at least a dozen trials so far. Uh, basically, we don't want our heart to be beating more than about one beat per second at rest. You can measure your pulse right now. For the maximum lifespan, the target is like one beat a second to beat the clock. Uh, but don't worry if you're too fast. Heart rate is a modifiable risk factor. Yes, there are drugs, but there are also lifestyle regimens that can bring our resting pulse down The accumulated weight of evidence linking elevated resting heart rate to a shortened lifespan, even in apparently healthy individuals, makes a strong case for it to be considered in the assessment of risk. It's got strong advantages. Taking one's pulse is cheap, it takes little time, it's understandable to people, and it's something everyone can do at home to measure their progress to become an active participant in their own health management. Every 10 beats per minute increase is associated with a 10 to 20% increase in the risk of premature death. There seems to be a continuous increase in risk with increasing heart rate, at least for values above about a beat a second. So we can just look at our watch, and if our heart is beating faster than the seconds go by, even when we're just sitting quietly, then we have to do something about it, especially when we start getting up around 80 or 90. Men with no apparent heart disease evidence with a pulse of 90 may have five times higher risk of sudden cardiac death, meaning their first symptom is their last, 
compared to those down in the safety zone. Living up around 90 increases heart disease risk at a level similar to smoking. If you ask most doctors, though, 90 is considered normal. The accepted limits of heart rate have long been set at 60 to 100 beats per minute. How did they come up with that? It was adopted as a matter of convenience just based on the scale of the squares on EKG paper. A historical accident, like the QWERTY keyboard that just became the norm. 60 to 100 doesn't even represent the bell curve. These cardiologists measured the heart rate of 500 people and concluded that 45 to 95 was a better definition of normal, uh, rounding to 50 to 90, uh, which a survey of leading cardiologists conferred with, concurred with. Uh, now we know that normal doesn't necessarily mean optimal, but doctors shouldn't be telling people with heart rates in their 50s that they're too low. In fact, they may be right where they should be. Certainly a heart rate higher than 80 should ring an alarm bell, but what can we do about it? Well, exercise is one obvious possibility. Ironically, you make the heart go faster so that the rest of the time your heart beats slower. The public health benefits of physical exercise, especially for heart protection, widely accepted, and among the many biological mechanisms proposed to account for this risk-reducing effect is autonomic nervous system regulation of the heart. That's your brain's ability to slow down the resting beat of our heart. If you put people through a 12-week aerobic conditioning program of cycling, stairmaster, and running on a treadmill, you can drop their resting heart rate down from about 69 to about 66, so three beats per minute drop. Of of course, you have to keep it up. Stop exercising, your resting heart rate goes right back up. Exercise is just one way to drop our heart rate, though. The way to our heart may also be through our stomach. What if instead of three months of exercise, you did three months of beans, a cup a day of beans, chickpeas, or lentils? The first randomized controlled trial of beans for the treatment of diabetes, and indeed successfully improved blood sugar control, dropping A1C levels from 7.4 to 6.9. But this was also the first study to ever assess the effect of bean consumption on heart rate, and indeed one of the few to determine the effect of, on heart rate of any dietary intervention. Now this is particularly important in diabetics, since having a higher resting heart rate not only increases the risk of death, just like everybody else, but also appears to predict greater risk of diabetic complications, such as damage to the nerves and eyes. So how did beans do? A 3.4 beat drop in heart rate, just as much as the 250 hours on a treadmill. We're not sure why beans are as powerful as exercise in bringing down one's resting heart rate, in addition to the potential direct beneficial effects of all the good stuff in legumes, you know, there's also the potential displacement value of reducing some of the animal protein foods by eating so many beans instead. Regardless, we should consider eating pulses for our pulse. In the documentary Supersize Me, Morgan Spurlock eats exclusively at McDonald's for a month, and predictably his weight, blood pressure, and cholesterol go up, but so do his liver enzymes, a sign his liver cells are dying and spilling their contents into the bloodstream. His one-man experiment was actually formally replicated. A, a group of men and women agreed to eat two fast food meals a day for a month, and most of their liver values started out normal, under 30 here for men, but within just one week, most were out of whack, a profound pathological elevation in liver damage. What's happening is NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, the next global epidemic. Fatty deposits in the liver can result in a disease spectrum from asymptomatic fat buildup to NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, uh, which can lead to liver scarring and cirrhosis, which can result in liver cancer, liver failure, and death. It's now the most common cause of chronic liver disease in the U.S., affecting 70 million Americans. That's like one in three adults. And fast food is a great way to bring it on, since it's associated with the intake of soft drinks and meat.
One can of soda a day may raise the odds of fatty liver 45%, and those eating the equivalent of 14 chicken nuggets worth of meat a day have nearly triple the rates of fatty liver compared to like seven nuggets or less. It's been characterized as a tale of fat and sugar, but evidently not all types of fat. Those with fatty hepatitis ate more animal fat and cholesterol, less plant fat, fiber, and antioxidants, which may explain why adherence to a Mediterranean-style diet characterized by high consumption of foods such as fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, is associated with less severe non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, perhaps because of the anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effects. Uh, maybe because of specific phytonutrients, like the purple-red, blue anthocyanin pigments in berries and grapes and plums, red cabbage, red onions, radicchio. These anthocyanin-rich foods may be promising for the prevention of fatty liver, but that's mostly based on petri dish experiments. There was one clinical trial that did find drinking a purple sweet potato beverage uh, seemed to successfully dampen liver inflammation, though. A more plant-based diet may also improve our microbiome, the good bacteria in our gut. The old adage, we are what we eat, may be changing to we are what our bacteria eat. And when we eat fat, uh, we may facilitate the growth of bad bacteria, which can release inflammatory molecules that increase the leakiness of our gut and contribute to fatty liver disease. Fatty liver disease can also be caused by cholesterol overload. Uh, the thought is that dietary cholesterol found in eggs, meat, and dairy oxidizes, and then upregulates liver X receptor alpha, which can upregulate something else called SREBP, which can increase the level of fat in the liver. Cholesterol crystals alone cause human white blood cells to spill out inflammatory compounds, just like you know, uric acid crystals in gout. Uh, that's what may be triggering the progression of just plain fatty liver into serious hepatitis. The accumulation of sufficient concentrations of free cholesterol within fatty liver cells to cause crystallization of the cholesterol, uh, one of several recent lines of evidence suggesting that dietary cholesterol plays an important role in the development of fatty hepatitis, fatty liver inflammation. In a study of 9,000 American adults followed for 13 years, they found a strong association between dietary cholesterol intake and hospitalization and death from cirrhosis and liver cancer, as dietary cholesterol can oxidize and cause toxic and carcinogenic effects. To limit the toxicity of excess cholesterol derived from the diet, the liver tries to rid itself of cholesterol by dumping it into the bloodstream. And so by measuring the non-HDL cholesterol in the blood, one can predict the onset of fatty liver disease. If you subtract HDL from total cholesterol, none of the hundreds of people they followed with a value under 130 develop the disease. Drug companies view non-alcoholic fatty liver disease as a bonanza, as is the case of any disease of affluence, considering its already high and rising prevalence, needing continuous pharmacologic treatment. Uh, but maybe it's as easy as changing our diet, avoiding sugary and cholesterol-laden foods. The unpalatable truth is that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease could almost be considered the human equivalent of foie gras, as we force-feed ourselves foods that can result in serious health implications. However, having such a buttery texture in human livers is not a delicacy to be enjoyed by liver doctors in clinical practice, as it can have such serious consequences. Despite evidence going back 40 years that the turmeric spice component curcumin possessed significant anti-inflammatory activity, it wasn't until 2005 that it was first tested on inflammatory bowel disease. Why did it take so long? Well, who's going to fund such a study? Big curry? But a lack of corporate backing doesn't stop individual doctors from giving it a try which is what these New York physicians did. They decided to ask the next five patients that walked through the door with ulcerative colitis to start curcumin supplements. Ulcerative colitis is a debilitating, chronic, relapsing, remitting, meaning comes and goes, inflammatory bowel disease that afflicts millions. Uh, 
As with most diseases, we have a bunch of drugs to treat people, but sometimes they can add to disease complications. Most commonly, nausea, vomiting, headaches, rash, fever, and inflammation of the liver, pancreas, and kidneys, as well as potentially wiping out our immune system and infertility. Uh, and most ulcerative colitis patients need to be on drugs every day for the rest of their lives, so we really need something safe to keep the, drug, the disease under control. So how do they do on the spice extract? Overall, all five subjects improved by the end of the study, and four out of five were able to decrease or eliminate their meds. They had more formed stools, less frequent bowel movements, less abdominal pain and cramping. One even reported decreased muscle soreness that they normally felt after their exercise routine. Uh, but this was what's called an open-label study, meaning that the patients knew that they were taking something, and so some of the improvement may have just been the placebo effect. In 2013, another small open-label pilot study found encouraging results in a pediatric population, but what was needed was a larger-scale double-blind placebo-controlled trial, and here we go. They took a bunch of people with quiescent ulcerative colitis and gave them either turmeric curcumin, along with their typical anti-inflammatory drugs, or a placebo in their drugs. In the placebo group, eight relapsed out of 39, meaning their disease flared back up. In their curcumin group, only two out of 43, significantly fewer. And relapsed or not, clinically the placebo group got worse, and the curcumin group got better and endoscopically, objectively visualizing the inside of their colons, the same thing, a trend towards worse or better. 5% relapse rate in the curcumin group, 20% relapse rate in the just conventional care group. It was such a dramatic difference that the researchers wondered if it was just some kind of fluke. I mean, even though patients were randomized to each group, maybe through some chance coincidence, their curcumin group just ended up being much healthier. And so maybe it was some freak occurrence rather than curcumin that accounted for the results. So what they did was they extended the study another six months, but put everyone on placebo. So they stopped the curcumin to see if they'd then start relapsing too, and that's exactly what happened. All of a sudden, they became just as bad as the sugar pill group. Conclusion. Curcumin seems to be a promising and safe medication, no side effects at all reported, for maintaining remission in patients with quiescent ulcerative colitis. So, curry for the cure? asked an accompanying editorial in the Journal of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America. Can curcumin be added to our list of options with respect to maintaining remission in ulcerative colitis? What is noteworthy, as I mentioned, is the fact that not only did the authors demonstrate a statistically significant decrease in relapse at six months, but a statistically significant improvement in the endoscopic index as well. Equally telling is the fact that upon withdrawal of curcumin, the relapse rate quickly paralleled that of patients treated initially with placebo, implying that curcumin was, in fact, exerting some important biologic effect. That's the same thing a Cochrane review concluded in 2013 may be a safe and effective adjunct therapy. Uh, Cochrane reviews take all the best studies meeting strict quality criteria and compile all the best science together, uh, normally a gargantuan undertaking, but not in this case, as there's really just that one good study. In the editorial that accompanied the landmark study showing an extract of the spiced turmeric could be used to fight ulcerative colitis, they congratulated the researchers on performing the largest study ever on complementary or alternative medicine approaches to treat inflammatory bowel disease. But that's not saying much. Two of the only other high-quality trials tried aloe vera gel and wheatgrass juice. No significant improvements in clinical remission rates or endoscopy findings on aloe vera, but the wheatgrass findings were impressive. Wheatgrass juice in the treatment of active distal ulcerative colitis. The use of wheatgrass juice for treatment of various gastrointestinal other conditions has been suggested by wheatgrass proponents for more than 30 years, but was never clinically assessed in a controlled trial until this study. The use of wheatgrass juice 
and the treatment of ulcerative colitis was brought to their attention by several patients who attributed improvement to the regular use of this stuff. So in a pilot study, they gave 100 cc's a day, which is between like a third and a half of a cup, of wheatgrass juice for two weeks to 10 patients. Eight patients described clinical improvement. One had no change, one got worse. Why had I never heard of that study? Because it was never published. They thought they were really on to something, so they wanted to do it right. So this randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial was designed to examine the effects of wheatgrass juice in patients with active lower colon ulcerative colitis. They found that treatment with wheatgrass juice was associated with reductions in the overall disease activity and the severity of rectal bleeding. 90% of the wheatgrass patients improved, and none got worse. They conclude that wheatgrass juice appeared effective and safe as a single or added treatment of active lower ulcerative colitis. Uh, no answer is available at present as to the site of wheatgrass juice action. Does the active substance get absorbed into the body and have some kind of general anti-inflammatory effect, or does it act locally right in the colon? How would you figure that out? Well, you could always juice in the opposite direction. Uh, a study like this raises so many questions. How would wheatgrass juice do head-to-head -head against other treatments? Uh, does it have any role in preventing attacks, or only when you already have one? Should we be giving it to people with Crohn's disease too? Uh, what's the best dose? It's been over 10 years since the publication of this study, yet nothing since. How sad. I mean, yes, no one's going to make a million selling wheat berries, uh, but what about the wheatgrass juicer companies? I wish they'd pony up some research dollars. Until then, though, wheatgrass appears to offer a genuine therapeutic advantage in this disabling disease, that is, if you can stand the taste. The Paleolithic period, the Stone Age, only goes back about Two million years, humans and other great apes have been evolving for the last 20 million years, starting back in the Miocene era. Uh, we hear a lot about the Paleolithic diet, but that just represents the last 10% of hominid evolution. What about the first 90%? During the Miocene era, the diet is generally agreed to have been a high-fiber, plant-based diet. For the vast majority of our family's evolution, we ate what the rest of our great ape cousins eat, leaves, stems, and shoots, in other words vegetables, and fruits, seeds, and nuts. Anatomically, I mean, the digestive tracts of humans and our fellow great apes are very similar. In fact, our DNA is very similar. So what do they eat? Largely vegetarian diets with high greens and fruit consumption. Uh, just largely vegetarian? Uh, yeah, chimpanzees have been known to hunt, kill, and eat prey, but the intake of Food of animal origin by chimpanzees is at a very low level, with only 1.7% of chimp stools providing evidence of animal food consumption, based on eight years of work collecting nearly 2,000 fecal samples. So even the most carnivorous of great apes appears to eat like a 98% plant-based diet. We may be closest to the diet of bonobos, uh, one of the less known great apes, uh, who eat nearly exclusively plant-based diets as well. Even our Paleolithic hunters and gatherers must have done an awful lot of gathering to get upwards of 100 grams of fiber a day. Uh, so what would happen if you put people on an actual Paleolithic diet, not a supermarket checkout aisle magazine paleo diet or some caveman blogger diet, but an actual 100 plus grams of fiber diet? or even better, a Miocenic diet, taking into account the last 20 million years of evolution since we split with our common great ape ancestor. Dr. David Jenkins and colleagues gave it a try. They tested the effects of feeding a diet very high in fiber. We're talking 150 grams a day, far higher than the recommended 20 to 30 grams a day. But you know, 150 was you know, like what populations in rural Africa used to eat, populations almost entirely free from many of our chronic killer diseases, like colon cancer and heart disease. All right, look at this. They were not messing around. Uh, 
so uh, what would you have for lunch today? Oh, a pound of cabbage. <laughs> Certainly, uh, just eating lots of fruits, veggies, and nuts can't be very satisfying. Uh, no, it got the maximum satiety rating, 3 out of 3 by every one of the 10 subjects. Why? Because all the diets were designed to be weight-maintaining. They didn't want you know, weight loss to confound the data. And so to eat a full day's calories of whole plant foods, they had to shovel in about 11 pounds of food a day. <laughs> Not surprisingly, resulting in some of the largest bowel movements ever recorded in the medical literature. In the men, exceeding a kilogram per day. Uh, you know how some people on weight loss diets lose like you know, two pounds a week? Well, here they dropped two pounds in one day. But that's not the only record-breaking drop, a 33% drop in LDL cholesterol within just two weeks, even without any weight loss. Bad cholesterol levels dropped a third in two weeks. That's the biggest drop I've ever seen in any dietary intervention. Better than a starch-based vegetarian diet. Better than a low-saturated fat American Heart Association type vegetarian diet. A cholesterol reduction equivalent to a therapeutic dose of a statin drug. So one needs to take a drug to get our cholesterol levels down to where they'd normally be if we ate a more natural diet. We've been eating 100 grams of fiber every day for millions of years, similar to what's eaten by populations who don't suffer from many of our chronic diseases. Maybe this shouldn't be called a very high fiber diet. Maybe what we eat should be considered a very low, an extremely fiber-deficient diet. Maybe it's normal to eat 100 grams of fiber a day. Maybe it's normal to be free of heart disease. Maybe it's normal to be free of constipation and hemorrhoids and diverticulitis and appendicitis and colon cancer and obesity and type 2 diabetes and all the other diseases of Western civilization.